Hello. So the full program, let's start. So it's going to be about net neutrality and it's going to be about Europe. So um, because of what happened in India today, uh, this week, we're going to look at this as well. So we're going to look at the complete world. So it's going to be about the internet. And we've talked already about a lot about the net neutrality and the choices the only single person has and about the market. But also the shift within the debate is that is net neutrality is also about the global unity of the net. So there are two principles which you can lead, trace it back to. So the end-to-end -end principle of the internet, so from each aspect of the internet you can make a connection to another point in the internet. So it's not like TV, but you don't have anyone who could like make different qualities within the connection. So it's about having the same choices and chances. So there's no discrimination on the internet. And all have the same level playing field where you have democracy and freedom. So the main point of those topics are because of the two forms of discrimination we are confronted today. The technical discrimination happens if a provider is discriminating a, a service which get um, shortened or completely abandoned. So we know that from um, IPs get excluded from the um, providers, so people have to choose a more expensive roaming. So more important is even the economical discrimination on a scale of uh, prices. So some uh, services get um, excluded and some other services are included. And for instance, Spotify is doing that. So Spotify is in the pole position of the um, users of the German telecom. So we have, as net neutrality activists, the problem that our dystopia, that the dystopia of reality is... ...in der man sieht, wenn alles gedrosselt wird, dann kann der Nutzer noch einzelne thematische Pakete kaufen, wo er dann beliebig viel Sprachtelefonie oder News oder Shopping nutzen kann. So, so here you see, um, when the user has a flat rate, um, he can, uh, they can uh, buy packages for uh, uh, different kinds of services, like uh, certain social media uh, services or gaming, and this is real in Hungary today. And to talk about this, we have to talk about Ettinger, the uh, commissioner. Das Game kann aber irgendwo nicht perfekt auf dem Bildschirm sein, aber Verkehrssicherheit, ein kommerzieller Dienst. Gesundheit, ein kommerzieller Dienst und ein paar andere fallen mir ein, sollten von der Netzneutralität, von diesem Tannenwald-ähnlichen Thema abweichen. So we have commercial services that we need to um, deliver to people, otherwise it's comparable to Taliban. So um, yes, we heard this. Um, that's why we need to abolish net neutrality, because we need to deliver all of these services, otherwise we will have Taliban-like circumstances. So what we're talking about are special services, services that not normally depart part of the internet. You, we've always had special services, telecommunications, certain networks that have only always been used that actually do not have anything to do with um, the internet, for example, machine-to-machine -machine communication. But especially in the debate today, we have a lot of examples like this, um, where Artinger is talk like Artinger who's talking about these things, but then you think, well, health, transport, these things don't actually have anything to do with the internet. This is not actually net neutrality. Um, this, and so people might think, well, hmm, yes, this is important, so maybe we should um, abolish these, uh, the net neutrality so that these things are possible. But in reality, these things 
things have always been possible and will also be possible in the future. Even if we implemented the most the strictest version of net neutrality that we're looking at in Europe right now, all these services would still be possible. So the services we're actually talking about are these. The services that use a lot of bandwidth and who also are uh, who also make a lot of profit from having these customers on being on the lines of the telecommunications providers. This is where they want to get more money, and especially the communications providers um, want some of the money that these companies are making. And especially for, especially these services need to be excluded from a good definition of special services. These services should not be ex included. These services will completely will definitely be able to survive even um, in, a net new, in, an, in an internet that is based on net neutrality. So we also heard from Commissioner Ettinger that we will have Taliban-like circumstances in Germany and that this problem is not solvable. So we see here a map from Digital Monitor. Uh, actually quite renowned publication that is looking at internet neutrality and looking at how it works, especially in Europe. And here you can see that the situation in Europe is disastrous. And you can see that there's a lot of products that are already being offered today that are undermining the principle of net neutrality. So we have a situation where the market is creating facts and the market is creating reality already. So the longer we discuss about these things, the more, more time we give to all these actors on the market to create a reality. And that's why we have an, uh, just started another iteration of Save the Internet. So maybe just go back in history. We had an EU guideline that was published by Neil LaCrosse. We talked about the topic of net neutrality in 2010. So now um, this whole thing is becoming serious. And then we had um, actually a draft law on the table, and that was, that's when we started the first iteration of this campaign, and this campaign actually helped us to win in the European Parliament. And when the debate continued in the European Council, when the 28 member states are actually talking about this law, then we had the third iteration of this campaign that luckily was mainly supported by Access Now, but we had um, direct contact to the representatives in the European Council. Council. So now we're at the fourth step. Now the three different EU institutions are negotiating with each other and we have started yet another campaign, again with the same banner at the same title, that enables you to contact your um, MEPs in the European Parliament directly, to call them, to send them emails, to uh, tell them that they should act for net neutrality for it not to be lost in Europe. So there's main three, three main points that we're critiquing and criticizing about the current law. So, First, we have all these arguments that we already talked about before, that you heard about before, and we will look at a more detailed uh, comparison of all these different um, ideas. So again, uh, blockings, um, blockings of certain websites is again a huge thing. Um, some people might remember the debate that we had about this in Germany a couple of years ago, and actually one of the draft laws that we have right now would allow certain websites being blocked. In every case, right now, this is still still possible. This is already possible to do this, but you still need a judge to decide on this. But based on the draft law by the Commission, um, someone someone could simply say, "Well, block this website," and it would be possible to block this website. That is definitely not rule of law. Um, a new topic which we should th thank the Brits for are youth. Um, youth protection filters, that certain contents will be censored, that you would install a certain, oh, it's not about installing a certain software on the computer of your children, but that the providers are directly discriminating and censoring content on the internet. We also need to talk about the global development. On the one hand, we have gotten a lot of support in the whole net neutrality debate by the FCC, the US regulating agency, um, actually deciding to implement a really good um, net neutrality legislation. So we also have um, John Oliver, who, with his quick piece, managed to make a lot of people realize what net neutrality meant and really create a conscience for this problem. So another problem that really 
gained a lot of attention was a merger between a lot of um, between the two groups of civil society and certain companies were actually there because they actually their interests overlap. And that actually created a really good debate in the United States and they now have a new law and we will see how it is going to be implemented. But we already have a lot of laws all over the world. We can already see the concrete consequences of what happens. So the most interesting case is probably Canada. There you had two zero rating um, offers from two TV apps that were forbidden and banned by the regulating agency. So in terms of economic discrimination, Canada took a very important step. Also in Europe, in Slovenia, there's two services, Hungermapa and Deezer, a Spotify competitor. Same in the Netherlands, where CIS, HBO Go, so two more TV apps, and KPN. KPN also wanted to offer a TV app, which is called ITV, where you would be able to watch as many TV series on your phone as you wanted to, and that was also supposed to be zero rated, so you would have your monthly package for data, but on top of that you would be able to watch as many TV shows as you wanted to. Actually that was quite restrictive, so with the, like, with the one and two gigabyte that you would get from KPN in general, you wouldn't be able to watch all these series. So when they realized that they wouldn't be able to offer this zero rating package, they just doubled the volume that users would have in terms of data. Because they saw that, well, if we can't prioritize our own service, then we simply need to give more data to all our, pe to all our customers. So this is one of the central points in the debate on net neutrality. So as long as it is possible to sell these packages, so as long as there's an incentive to do these things, it is unlikely that the companies will actually give this addition, these additional data to people because there's going to be an incentive for them to create uh, to create an artificial shortage of these things and there's little, so there's little incentive for them to actually continue improving the network that we already have. So this is also something else that we will talk about a lot. So the, for example the Global South, let's for example look at Chile where the government actually banned the zero rating of social networks. Twitter, WhatsApp and Facebook are now not zero, aren't zero rated anymore but are actually counted into the normal data usage. Initially, Wikipedia Zero was also supposed to be um, included in this, but actually, thanks to lobbying efforts by the Wikimedia in Chile, um, Wikipedia Zero for, um, still exists. So now we already arrived at a very interesting debate that couldn't be more current, more important for current affairs. So, firstly, zero rating in developing countries, and secondly, what does the access to internet look like? First, in the initially, I already talked about how this is about the global unity of the internet we have a huge amount we have 4 billion people who still not have don't have access to the internet and internet helps people that's entirely clear it doesn't really matter which uh, stage of development these like, countries are in so right now we have a trend of trying to bring more and more people into the internet but here certain companies play an especially important role the most well-known uh, example is Internet.org, a Facebook initiative with which Mark Zuckerberg is in the media a lot. There are other um, other initiatives like Wikipedia.zero um, or a Google initiative, but this is really the mo best known one. And they will be paying for the data of people who would not be able to afford internet otherwise. So, of course, Facebook also does this to grow. They realize that they make much less money per user than, for example, Google. And Google is much, much older, is much more established, and is really much more established in the market. So the strategy that Facebook is uh, using right now is growing in developing countries to simply balance out a lack of, a lack of quality with the quantity. And that is why especially Facebook and Google are using a lot of money in a very creative, for example, their projects where they want to use Zeppelins and drones to actually cover whole countries with mobile with a mobile network. 
Funknetzwerke aufzubauen, versucht man einfach eine Versorgung. So people try to get um, air internet from the air. So we have a new infrastructure here, which is not buried down deep down in the earth or from any cells, but it's coming. Um, from above and it can be removed after 100 days and it doesn't take so much time to install it. But the problem is actually not so much the physical um, access to it, but it's more the people who live the people actually already live in areas where they could get internet, but it's more about the price because people cannot afford it. So to quote Facebook here, it's not so much, it's about the affordability of the internet and about who pays for it and to raise awareness how awesome the internet is. So why why can I see, how can I see how many options the internet has if I don't have the internet? So Mark Zuckerberg is already argumenting with his own experience with that, that he had his own idea about starting Facebook. But the problem is that people who use internet.org cannot start a startup like Facebook, who could be like even um, a new Facebook. So here, the, it, this argument doesn't really count really, because people would never build up something new like Facebook who are using internet.org. So how do we finance the internet access for those people who are not online yet? So internet.org is um, proves that people pay with their data for the access to internet. And this, ha this has some very significant um, results. So there's a study from some Asian countries and they ask people when did they use internet for the last time when did they use Facebook the last time and there was this statistical anomaly that people were saying they used Facebook but they said they didn't use the internet so they were not aware that Facebook is part of the internet so half of the people from those people think actually that Facebook is the internet so people who use the internet for the first time through such zero rating offers. They don't have the experience we have, so they just experience the internet through Facebook. So there aren't any alternatives to the internet for them. So that was the situation. And now we have something in India which no one expected. So um, a group of YouTubers, um, similar to John Oliver, explained the issue of net neutrality to people. The net neutrality problems were already known, but it was differently um, shown to people. And it was made in a fun way, so people could actually understand what it was about. So this resulted in a huge wave of outrage in India. And um, a lot of companies decided to stop their participation at internet.org, because there was this morally component suddenly, because it was about like um, economical racism or economical colonialism. So um, people were forced to use that kind of service, um, and there were and this was the debate in India, and then this Monday, Mark Zuckerberg um, said in front of the cameras, to open internet.org so anyone can build free basic services. Soon, we're going to share an open technical spec, and any compatible service will be available through internet.org across the whole world. This will give people even more choice and more free services while still creating a sustainable economic model to connect every single person in the world. This is big. This means that internet.org is not only a compilation of 12 or 20 offers, but it's going to be an open platform where people can actually apply with their website, and then over a central server from Facebook can use that kind of service, and can reach people who didn't even use or wanted to use the internet, and who just have a prepaid card on their phone who want to use like Facebook, but now they can also access the other services which are in this platform of internet.org. And this is a huge market, actually. So there is going to be a lot of offers in this market, which will be new online within the next weeks and months. 
And there is going to be a new trend because out of internet.org, we can click now on websites which are not part of the um, system. So what my customers see is a warning if I would have used to click on a website which is not part of the internet.org network. So this is going to change now in the next weeks and months. So what exactly are the, um, are the agreements of using internet.org? There is no encryption. It's LTS, uh, it's HTTPS. Uh, encryption, so only some very basic stuff. But there is no way to save yourself from spying attacks or the NSA if you use internet.org. There aren't any cookie policies or privacy policies. Uh, just the ones Facebook is using are used there. So it's technically probably that tracking cookies are installed there as well. And um, what users are doing there is tracked down as well. So Facebook is already taking the rights of what people are doing there and has the rights for their user-generated content as well. So there's going to be a veto right for Facebook that Facebook can just exclude people if they want to exclude them. So for instance, so the problems of um, stating your own opinion on Facebook is going to be a problem because um, Facebook has influence on what people can say on internet.org and Facebook has certain standards of uh, what you can say and what you cannot say and they're going to apply that of people who are not have the economical power to afford uh, their own internet access. And there's also going to be a license for everything which is going to be um, used or made on internet.org. That's the logo for internet.org. And I think Zuckerberg wanted to say something with um, this logo. So the circle is the internet. On the right-hand side, you can see the people who actually pay for the internet. They can protect themselves. Themselves. They have privacy, they can choose, but the people who are in the global south, they pay just with their data and they cannot pay for anything. They're, they're kind of naked, they don't have any privacy, they don't have any rights, they don't ha even have the knowledge on what kind of data they are actually creating. And Facebook is making the decision where we draw this line, where this, and um, this is a very huge problem. And um, to go back to a situation where now suddenly in India, one million of people are sending an email to the government and um, are getting engaged with a topic like net neutrality. And it's the biggest campaign in India which we ever have seen before. And um, the answer of Facebook is to give a voice to the poor. The solution to this very real problem to get internet access for those people is something we have to solve. But that needs a collective effort of people and companies. And it also needs sustainable investments into networks. So the volume that people get sponsored, should they should be able to use that for free. And they shouldn't be forced to use a system where their data is get used. And it is important that we today solve questions about the accessibility of websites and ads to um, so people from their low-end smartphones can actually reach those apps or websites. So someone uh, coming from Africa uh, cannot use some of the websites we're creating, so um, we have to we have to solve that. Let's come back to Europe at the title of this uh, talk. 
Today, we're at a point where the original law on net neutrality that was presented in 2013, almost everything has been cancelled, everything except for net neutrality and roaming. These are the two points that are still still there and that we're negotiating today. So this is the um, European legislation process. The Commission makes a makes a proposal that goes through commission like that goes through the council and the European Parliament and then in the end um, you will have a dialogue and then you hopefully have a solution and a law so all of these three institutions now have formed their opinion and when it comes to net neutrality we actually it's two to one against us so both the Commission and the council are ha, have quite disastrous ideas in reality that means that you have zero rating um, discrimination special services you actually only have um, a situation where we can live with in the case of the parliament. In the other cases, both economic and technical discrimination will be possible. The only thing that the European Council actually um, agreed to is not being able to block your own competitors, which is something the European Commission wanted. So, for example, a lot of things that are actually common usage um, in, China, in, in Germany already today they would be illegal under this. But at the same time, they still want these youth protection and porn filters. So in this trialogue, we have these people who are negotiating for us. There is um, Gunther Ettinger, um, the commissioner, um, Ms. Vera from the European People's Party, who's, who has a lot of formal power in this whole negotiation process. And then we also still have the uh, we, we actually have Latvia and Luxembourg. And the Commission actually came up with a proposal that was discussed in the media as well, where media said, oh, now we finally break the, finally break the deadlock, now we finally have a solution. But unfortunately, a lot of these reports were not terribly well informed, because if you actually look at the text, we can make it a bit easier. In terms of special services, we have three conditions that they actually come up with. First off, you can offer any special service as long as you have a sufficient amount, sufficient capacity in your network. That has two consequences. So first of all, the capacity of a provider is the most, at least the best protected secret that anyone will have, any provider will have. So nobody will tell you how much capacity is actually left on the certain, certain network. So, all of a sudden, this well-protected trade secret is something that's becoming a criteria based on which you can actually turn any new service, you can actually reject any new service. Also, the question of capacity misses the question of um, prices and data volume. So, secondly, there's a condition that's not even not completely useless, which, mean, which says that special services are not supposed to be a replacement for internet access, so something like internet.org would not be permitted until this point. So, we, here we actually have a certain long-term view um, that the Commission is taking. So, if, for example, somebody was offering a certain special service that was supposed to be um, completely, a uh, complete substitute for internet access, that would be illegal. And the third point says that the availability and quality of the internet access of other users cannot be lowered by your access and this very special service. But that can also be a problem. Because, for example, consider a provider that has actually invested a lot of money into improving a certain network, then they will think twice if they actually use this new capacity for your best effort internet or for this for these much more profitable special services. So there's a lot of incentives that can actually become quite dangerous in the long run. So looking at this holistically, we can see that the Commission, with its compromise, has actually simply copied what the Council said. So it's not actually a compromise, but that fits into the picture that we already have. So that's the strategy of our opponents and what we consider Oettinger to be using. They are arguing far away from the facts and they're talking about a lot of things that do not actually have any relation to the things we're talking about. They're offering compromises that aren't actually compromises without talking about real net neutrality. At the same time, they're focusing heavily on the question of roaming. So roaming will be negotiated 
as quickly as possible to push the parliament into a corner where they need to agree to everything about roaming and there will not be any more discussion about net neutrality. So essentially they're trying to let the discussion die down. And so essentially they will be mainly talking about roaming, which already was a topic in the last European parliamentary elections. And so the idea would be to simply forget about net neutrality. So they will be simply be agreeing on something that actually abolishes net neutrality, but the only thing they will be talking about is roaming. So there's three dangers here. First danger, roaming instead of net neutrality. So the European Parliament needs to stand up now and cannot sacrifice net neutrality to this other topic. The European Parliament needs to stand by the text that it decided upon um, in this first hearing, for which it got a lot of applause. Second danger is a bit procedural. In 2016, there will be a regular reform of the complete telecommunications framework for the whole of Europe. This reform will not be implemented before 2018. So that's already quite optimistic because these huge reform pa packages are normally negotiated over years. And at the same time, we're talking about the guideline that is not directly going to be a law within the European Union, but needs to be implemented in national law by the different states. So in 2018 is very the most like the earliest possible time at which this um, reform would be implemented. So let's go back again. This is the situation that we have in the market right now. So if we give these telecommunication providers until 2018 to create a reality, then nobody will remember this debate on net neutrality anymore. Or we will need to get rid of um, services that are already firmly established in the market. And third danger is actually the conclusion that we as net neutrality activists need to draw. And that is also our own fault if we look at the United States and India. Net neutrality is a topic that is far too complex, it's way too technical, it's way too economic, and it's not understandable by the whole public. But we can see that if you have this funny YouTube video, you can actually reach a lot of people. So that's actually um, what I'm trying to do today. I'm reaching out to all comedians. Um, and video bloggers try looking at this topic and try explaining this topic to people. It's really t high time for us to invest ourselves um, into campaigning for a free internet, and otherwise Ertinger will be doing this. And we have given the tools to you with Save the Internet to do this. You can go on our website, you can call or email or tweet to all of these um, representatives in the European Parliament who are dealing with this topic already. Create attention. European, we have already managed to convince the European Parliament with already with exactly these tools. So we keep, we're doing everything we can to keep the platform on the current level. A lot of you guys simply stand, sent the standard facts um, to these politicians. Um, so a lot of them were maybe a bit upset if they got the same facts 30 or 100 times. So we're actually trying to put some effort into actually sending translated faxes and translated messages to these MEPs. So in the case of a fax, actually, this fax falls out of the printer. So this is a physical reminder that you cannot simply forget this and you can't filter this out, um, can't filter this out. Uh, with the spam folder. And you cannot simply turn off your fax if we want to use your printer. So we have a lot of success uh, in the countries which um, provide zero rating. In the US, we're against everything. We had a 180 degree turn. And now we're at the point where Europe is close to uh, abandon the net neutrality, so we would really miss out on digital innovation if this would happen. So to get closer to this topic, to put the focus on it, uh, we have a new video on Save the Internet. Net neutrality kills. This is the argument which internet providers uh, try to get more money from you to save money. But what is net neutrality? Net neutrality means that all data which go through the internet are treated equally, no matter which information, no matter from whom. This principle is good for you because it means that internet provider cannot access your data 
and they could not stop your data or they could force you to pay extra money for using Skype or video games. So this is then you have to pay extra money f to get like a video streaming, for instance. And if you get like a video extra package, then you could pay more. Uh, then you have to pay more. And also they want to get extra money from companies like YouTube. So they would ask them for extra money to, to pay. So no problem. You just have to sign here. And then you can we can grant for a fast transport of your data. So without any law on this, um, the internet will ask, the, your providers will ask for money. But if net neutrality is obviously that important for us, why isn't there a law which is asking for it, which is demanding net neutrality? So at the moment, the European Union is talking about introducing a law for net neutrality, but most politicians don't like net neutrality because most of the politicians are saying that um, the internet traffic is increasing that much and that's why we need to regulate it. Because um, actually the providers do not want to increase the capacity of the internet. So that's why they can ask for more money by um, asking money for extra services. So for instance, they are having arguments like doctors should be or companies should be allowed to use extra services. But actually this is not true because companies and doctors are already using other services anyways, so this is not an argument against it. Um, Self-driving cars could make accidents or get into accidents. But then high traffic on the internet also wouldn't be a problem for that. And also the argument for cars is not valid because um, cars do not use the internet, which would be um, considered in the case. So with that argument, the internet providers convince the politicians in uh, Brussels to actually be against net neutrality. But that's why you have to get involved and message your message the politicians and tell them that you think net neutrality is important and um, do that for free and accessible and payable, affordable internet. Thank you to Alexander Lehmann who has made the Drossel come video um, first of all about the video um, we have it now on five videos and we already send out 5,000 faxes even though it's just in the beginning of the trilogue um, discussions but those discussions are very intransparent so we don't know that much about it and we actually also don't really know what they take place. There aren't any open, uh, accessible documents about it. So um, we follow this whole process um, over the Office of Digital Rights. So without the force from from the people, we do not manage to solve this problem. Now we have 20 minutes time for questions. So after Thomas has uh, threatened us with the digital commissioner and shown us this movie, why it is important to save the internet or the net neutrality. So are there any questions or comments? There.
Thank you for your speech. I want to ask how many, how much influence does TTIP, um, how, how much influence does that have on net neutrality? We know that TISA is influencing the topic of net neutrality. There is a document from Washington which is actually addressing that. Tomorrow there is going to be a talk from someone from Access Now which will be explicitly dealt with that topic. And this leaked document actually is also part of the TTIP um, discussions. But the problem of such treaties is that we cannot make any concrete statements about it because we do not know the content and the complete text of it, what their discussion actually. Um, so if we if we do not get um, I have a question about the political tactics. Um, lately, I've read an article where Mr. Ottinger said um, where he called an internet rights activist um, a Taliban member. And I actually think you're way too polite with Mr. Ottinger. And you should treat him like a snail. You should be offensive and direct. You should put him where he is. And you're way too polite. And this is a real problem. Because from my point of view, it's really a problem in the German debate. Maybe it's different in different uh, communities, but just by coincidence, Oettinger is German. But Oettinger should really embarrass, and he should really come back to Germany and be embarrassed and be under the pressure of the internet community. And everyone should be really angry about him, actually. So I ask you to be way more aggressive and way more personal as well. So he gets forced to make a change. Because if he can say that you are the Taliban, you should you should tell him what a real shitstorm is and um, change your tactics. And not only send them some faxes, because this doesn't really change that much. I think you should really focus that on Oettinger, because he said yes to the telecom. And you should really pin him down on that. So the people on the commission are actually not influenced by that that much. It's just him. So you have to put him under the pressure. And you have to do that before the summer. And then you can win this debate. I love a good shitstorm, but um, yeah, for sure. Oettinger should be more in the focus of the whole debate. And the strategy for that is that the that netspolitik.org has that kind of strategy, and also the Digitale Gesellschaft, Digital Society. Um, so the Taliban, the, the comment about that we are the Taliban is really, that really goes way too far. So that's why we have to do something against that. And um, the problem is that the commissioners are doing what he is saying. So, um, and he's also part of one of the strongest countries of the year. EU. So that's why we have to influence also the other commissioners and also people from other countries as well. Um, but yeah, I'm very happy about any shit story in regards to Günther Oettinger. And especially Especially, I don't see it as like my my task to do that, to um, introduce that. But really, what he is actually saying, we should really focus on that more, because our strategy has changed in such a way that um, one third of our speaking time is actually to just um, to just explain what he has said wrong, we have to explain that. But the problem is issues are really hard to explain. And that's why it takes so much time for us to explain things. That's why we also made that video to explain it to people. Yeah, um, there are also some people here from the media. So one question for me. Do you think the media is actually representing in the right way what, media, what uh, Ettinger is saying? Or do you think they 
actually say that in the right way. I think Gunther Attinger is really um, putting the focus on himself because the media is really likes to show um, some embarrassment. But the difference is that in Germany, this debate is not really that far yet in Germany. However, in France or in the Netherlands, this debate is like way more approached already. But um, in Germany, it is not yet that far. That's why we need a bigger focus on that also from um, the media and also better examples so people can understand it better. There is another question. I wanted to ask, it's always about Günther Oettinger um, because he's, but actually what about the, the German government? What about Angela Merkel who is against the net neutrality because apparently she said something against the net neutrality because of those self-driving cars. Um, should, shouldn't she deserve also a shitstorm? Yeah, the problem is you cannot order shitstorms. So um, it was a it was an event by Vodafone where Angela Merkel was saying that, and yes, she was totally far away from actually the facts and just making those examples which are not relevant at all. So um, within the discussions about that, um, the EU. Um, the CDU and the SPD were raising aspects against the net neutrality and are against it. So, and this is exactly the debate we're having now there within the EU. But the problem is that the Spanish and the Italians are also very much against it. Also because um, they have, um, we want to make the Und Deutschland hat sich da einfach zurückgelehnt und die anderen Länder machen lassen. Die gemütlichste Position für Deutschland im Rat ist immer, wenn sie eigentlich gar nichts tun müssen und es trotzdem in die Richtung läuft, in die sie, in die sie es haben wollen. Uh, damit man sozusagen den Druck und die, das Schwergewicht, um, das Deutschland im Rat hat, erst gar nicht zur so Anwendung bringen muss. So here there should be done so much more because Germany has a very central position inside here in this debate. Um, so someone from the SPD is actually very positively involved in this debate. The Social Democrats are still our hope. We still have hope for hopes for the Social Democrats. Um, in April 2014, if they would, they had this agreement, and if they would stick to that agreement, actually, and push that forward, and also talk about net neutrality, no, not also about roaming, we can actually have a chance to win this debate. So another question about the German debate, because you could see that very well in December last year, where. Sigmar Gabriel, um, as a economic minister, he he was actually saying something against net neutrality, so against the line of his his own party. Um, so that happened last year in December. So you should maybe check that out. So this is also a very interesting aspect of it, that you have this protection for investments and we should have investment-friendly opportunities for users. So there aren't any examples actually for um, where it was actually making sense for the provider to um, do something against net neutrality so they would actually make an economic um, success out of that. So um, the, the system of apps, apps and websites is um, is threatened if we abolish net neutrality. So that means if we would also ask questions from the economy and, um, for instance, startups um, should be way more involved in this debate in, and they're already involved in the European debate. And everyone who's involved in this debate should get um, part of the startups network who are for net neutrality. 
Because really, for the economy, we still need way more voices to get what we reached in India, what we reached in the US. And it was also in India, the startup scene, which was really pushing forward um, that the net neutrality was enforced. There's one more question. Was there someone? Yes, um, I wanted to ask for more um, participants who would be actually against, who would be actually for the net neutrality. So the different institutions which are part of that, the different parties, the different countries, uh, also the industry. So what about the big American internet companies? What is their part in this European debate? Well, partly they, Microsoft and Netflix are big, who do lobbyism in Brussels for the topic, but we actually need a, big, a bigger diversity of voices on this topic. So also like uh, governmental um, channels or youth channels or or podcasters, people, minorities, um, people who would potentially in a two-class internet be not in favor of such a new policy. So we need a bigger participation of people. And this is what Save the Internet can actually deliver. So we're a platform and we already have 11 organizations from um, several countries and um, just send an e email to save the internet at dot you so um, we have to get a bigger group and that's and this is how we can hurt can get hurt in the European Parliament I have another question about the campaign in India what did they do differently it sounds like we haven't done our homework correctly so, to, we have to do those, we have to consider those things. What have they done better in India than here? Why did people get inspired by that campaign? So we see that the topic of net neutrality is for the first time, um, it has to be in the bigger public, and um, you can communicate it over a big campaign. But the problem is that we're in the situation here that since 2010 we have the topic in Europe and we try to communicate it, we try to communicate the problem, and we have this campaign. But um, we're nearly at the end of it, so. Um, but even before June, there could be a result to the discussion about net neutrality. But what helped in India was the component of internet.org, that it was about Facebook versus um, the people from the region. So this is a voice from the global south. So in developing countries, we have a totally different discourse on that. And but that there are voices from the global south who are engaged with that was very inspiring. And, um, and also the video was very funny and very well done. And it is very important to put those very complicated topics in a very easy way and to like, make it accessible to people. The problem I personally have is that I cannot make it easy anymore because I'm very much engaged in that topic. So for me, it's very hard to explain myself with an easy word. OK, thank you very much. Thomas Loninger, can we have an applause, please?